Thanks for coming. I, I really apologize for the uh, the mix up that I had earlier. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, digital signal processing for software defined radio. Um, I also like to call it software defined radio in a nutshell. And so the reason that I wanted to do this talk is that a lot of you have probably messed around with software defined radios. Uh, and so this talk isn't an introduction to software defined radios. But a lot of people really don't know how they work um, and sort of the theory behind uh, the how data gets modulated and sent over the air. Um, and so I think there's sort of a lot of what I'll call script kiddies of software defined radio these days. And so um, in, in my own uh, work trying to figure this out on my own, I've, I've learned a, f a few key concepts that uh, I want to uh, talk about today, um, and it sort of covers uh, the essential tools for building your own software-defined radio applications. Um, it's not going to go deep into the theory or the math or exactly how it works, but um, this talk is intended to give you an idea of what you don't know and what you should uh, go out and learn more about on your own. So first, a very quick introduction to how radios work and how um, and this would be useful for um, <clears throat> later explaining how this gets translated into the digital domain. So as you all probably know, atoms are made of protons and electrons. These uh, exert a uh, force on each other. So uh, unlike particles attract, like particles repel. Um, you should all basically know that, and you can um, d define a, uh, a relative force uh, that is created by uh, one of these particles by uh, imagining a theoretical test charge and moving it around, um, sort of around uh, this uh, electron here, and then measuring the force that is exerted on that test charge. And so then you can express this um, this electric field as a field, uh, basically, and the force per unit charge of this test charge. And so if you, if you move this test charge away from this electron uh, sort of further out, there's less force exerted on it, but that also means that you have to do some work to move it over here. And so this, this difference is uh, called a potential difference or voltage, and this is um, what radios measure and use to uh, communicate. So the way, the way that they do that is, um, so for example, you might have a dipole antenna and it might induce uh, a voltage on the dipole antenna. So you have, uh, you sort of push some um, electrons to one side. And so on the other side, there's um, uh, effectively positive charge, you can think of it as charged particles, but it, basically it's an absence of electrons. And so to actually transmit this information, what a radio will do is uh, alternate the uh, polarity here and uh, create these uh, reversing electric fields, which then propagate uh, through space. And then when they hit another antenna, they will also induce a voltage on the uh, receiving antenna, and you can measure that as a voltage and uh, recover information that way. So this is all fine and dandy, but um, then the problem comes, well, how do you separate all these uh, transmitters and receivers from each other? I mean, you can't just you know, do this and, and uh, expect everything uh, to, to work. You need to, to um, uh, allow multiple users of, of the airwaves. And so the way that they do that is, uh, let's see here, through uh, different frequencies. And so the way that um, signals are, are actually transmitted is you have uh, these carrier frequencies, which is sort of how, how much you, you reverse um, the, the voltage going into the antenna. Uh, and then you modulate that uh, with different types of modulation. So uh, some of the very simplest uh, types of modulation, for example, is amplitude modulation, where you have a, a constant frequency of moving electrons back and forth. But uh, what you do is you change the amplitude of how much power is going back and forth. And then there's frequency modulation, uh, 
uh, where you actually change the frequency at which you, you move the, the electrons around. And so if you've been playing around with software-defined radios, um, you can actually visualize this. So this is a, a spectrum display here, um, and you can actually see uh, here's a um, commercial FM radio station, and you can sort of see the, the frequencies of the, the carrier going back and forth here. And the, the takeaway from this slide is that um, different transmitters get allocated uh, sort of different frequencies, and so you can see them across the spectrum. Uh, and this, this uh, applies widely. And so if you wanted to uh, actually recover this signal digitally, one thing that you could think about doing is just taking your antenna, stuffing it into an analog to digital converter and getting out that uh, voltage and then uh, doing some magic that I'll talk about later and recovering your signal that you wanted to transmit. Now, unfortunately, um, since you're transmitting stuff on these carrier waves that can go up into the gigahertz range, you would have to have an analog to digital converter that samples extremely fast to recover um, uh, enough of that uh, wave to recover the signal. So instead, um, yeah, this is what I just said. So um, basically, there's something called uh, uh, the Nyquist rate. So uh, if you have an incoming signal that is, um, say, this, uh, this red signal here, but you're only sampling it at these black points, then the only thing that you can recover is uh, an alias at a lower frequency. And so uh, one of the, the challenges in, in software-defined radios is, um, and radios and, well, software-defined radios is, uh, actually uh, dealing with this bandwidth limitation of analog to digital converters and conversely to transmit digital to analog converters. So the way that they actually do this is uh, software-defined radios shift frequencies uh, down to or up from zero hertz, um, sometimes known as a baseband. And the, the math behind it sort of exploits this uh, trig identity where um, if you multiply two sine waves of two different frequencies, what you get are two different, um, uh, a sum of two different frequencies and uh, two different waves. Um, and the frequencies of those two waves are both the sum of the frequencies and the difference of the frequencies. And so what you can do if you say want to tune into 89.5, what you can do is um, have a local oscillator run at 89.5 and then shift um, if you get if you receive something at 89.5 then the difference goes down to zero there will also be something at twice 89.5 and you just filter that out before it goes to the analog to digital converter uh, and this is sort of how it looks like um, as a as a block diagram there uh, as I said you know you uh, you usually use the difference and, and filter out the sum. So there's one more trick that's commonly used in uh, software-defined radios, um, and that is to use uh, complex signals. And so um, what that basically means is you have both uh, an in-phase wave and an out-of-phase, a 90 degrees out-of-phase uh, carrier local oscillator signal and you actually uh, have two different uh, signal paths here and you use them independently. And the, what this gets you is the ability to represent negative frequencies. Um, so for example, you can think of um, a, a uh, oscillator as uh, going around uh, this unit circle at a particular speed and that encodes the frequency. And if you look at the, the Y component, you would get, uh, say, a sine wave. If you look at the X component, then you get a cosine wave. And so with this, you can not only represent the, the rotational speed or the frequency, but also which way it's going. And this is how you can uh, represent negative frequencies. And this is also why um, 
why you will also see a lot of uh, I and I's and Q's and in and, uh, and software defined radio. So I stands for in phase, Q stands for quadrature. Um, so it's 90 degrees out of phase. All right, so now that we have a signal that we're receiving, um, how do we actually get data out of it? So say that we want to monitor some uh, um, unknown data source um, or unknown modem, and we want to start uh, demodulating it. So the, the typical steps for uh, demodulation um, are first frequency shifting. Um, so usually what you'll do in a software-defined radio is you'll sh the hardware will shift it down to some intermediate frequency, which is maybe not zero. It could be zero. Uh, but then you, you actually want to bring it all the way down to zero. And, and um, part of the reason you might do that in software is because uh, the, the local oscillator of your radio might not match the oscillator of the remote radio, and you have to do carrier tracking to make sure everything is um, demodulates correctly. Um, you need to uh, filter out any signals that aren't um, of interest uh, after you do the frequency shifting. Uh, filtering is also used um, to avoid uh, inner symbol interference, which I'll talk about later. Um, once you uh, once you do filtering, you have to synchronize both onto the uh, carrier frequency of the remote radio, as well as the um, uh, the bit clock of the sender, so that you know when to sample the signal. Uh, from there, uh, it gets uh, a bit easier. Um, you uh, will sample the incoming signal at a, a, a fixed rate. And um, then you can recover symbols from that, uh, which uh, or bits. So the difference between a bit and a symbol, so a bit is just a zero and a one. A symbol can be uh, multiple levels. So you can have like, a, uh, so there's like QAM. So you can have like a, a, a 16 or 32 or, or 256 different symbols, which can encode many different uh, bits in a single uh, sort of constellation point, and I'll talk about that uh, very shortly. Then once you get out the uh, bit stream, then there are some extra things um, that are all in the digital domain, and uh, I think um, I won't talk about much about those because um, uh, I think uh, working with bits is more familiar to people, um, but uh, I'll, I'll briefly touch on those later. All right, so now I'm going to get into some of the nitty gritty details of um, how uh, digital signal processing uh, works, how some, uh, some of the common tools you use in digital signal processing. And so the first one that I want to talk about is filtering. And filtering is one of the most fundamental tools of digital signal processing. So what this does is it takes in a signal and um, it, uh, you can imagine it as like sort of a graphical equalizer. It, it can uh, boost frequencies, it can drop frequencies. Uh, so you have filters like a, a low pass filter, a high pass filter. Um, so these are graphs in the, in the frequency domain. So you have a uh, frequency going across the x-axis here and the amplitude or the attenuation um, is in the y direction here. And so you can, uh, for example, a low pass filter will allow all low frequencies uh, through, but then after a certain cutoff point, which is usually uh, at negative three dB uh, uh, is the cutoff frequency, then it, it just sort of goes downhill from there. Um, and so if you, if you build these in, in uh, hardware, it's, it's very hard to get a very sharp cutoff. Um, uh, it's it's a bit easier to do digitally, but it's a trade-off between how sharp you want your filter and how much computation you want to do. And then there's other types of, of uh, simple frequency filters, such as a bandpass filter, which only allows certain frequencies through, and, and a notch filter, which uh, cuts out some frequencies. <clears throat> so one way you can describe filters is by what's known as their impulse response. And so the way to think of that is if you have a signal like this in the time domain, which is all zero except for a single blip at one point to uh, one, uh, 
and you send it through this filter, you look at the signal that comes out of that filter. So for example, if you uh, send this through a low pass filter here, uh, you might get this response out of the filter. And so this is actually how you build um, what are known as finite impulse response filters. And so the way that those work is you take this impulse response that you want uh, for your filter function and you put it in what's known as a, a filter kernel here. So um, uh, just imagine that those points that were here are now in here. Um, and when you push samples into this, this buffer, what you do is you multiply um, uh, component-wise the incoming samples with their corresponding positions in the filter kernel and then sum them all up and uh, spit them out as the output signal. So this is known as convolution. Uh, this is how finite impulse response filters work, or fur filters. If you see things about fur filters and GNU radio, for example, this is exactly what they're talking about. Um, these are called taps. So if you see something that refers to like the number of taps, um, uh, this is exactly what they're talking about. And so as you can see, the more taps you have, uh, the more computation you have to do, and so the, the slower it is. Yeah, so this is a fur filter with five taps. So another way that you can uh, determine the, the filter taps is, um, so you can take the frequency response uh, that you want, say, on, on those graphs from the, from the filtering uh, slide and use what's known as the inverse Fourier transform. And so what a, a Fourier transform does is it, it uh, converts signals between the time domain or sort of the, the received signal that you get and uh, the frequency domain. And so um, to make that a bit more concrete, so if you, if you have like an oscilloscope and you see like a, a wave going up and down there, that's sort of a representation in the time domain. So you have time across the bottom and amplitude up the y-axis, whereas in the frequency domain, you would see sort of a, a peak right at where the frequency is. And so Fourier transforms are used to go between the time domain and the frequency domain. All right, so uh, at this point, we have some uh, in-phase and quadrature uh, samples um, at uh, approximately zero hertz. And what's interesting about uh, IQ samples is that every modulation scheme can be described just by the amplitude of these I's and Q uh, symbols um, or signals. And the way that you can do that is represent um, these I and Q uh, points on, on a graph, a two-dimensional graph, I in one axis, Q on another axis, in what's known as a constellation diagram. Uh, so, for example, in a, in a very simple case uh, where you have, say, um, uh, let's see, uh, like 180 degree phase reversal for, for transmitting different bits, um, you don't care about the, the quadrature stuff. You, you're only looking at the amplitude of the in phase signal. And so it's either, um, you know, it's either um, a regular amplitude or it's, a, it's an inverted signal. Now, if you want to get a bit crazier, uh, you can um, start putting these different points uh, anywhere in this uh, constellation uh, diagram here. So, for example, you can encode two bits at a time by uh, having um, different amplitudes of both the, the I and Q symbols. And you can get uh, as arbitrarily complex as you want. So, this is like 16 qualm. So, you have... Um, which stands for quadrature amplitude modulation. Uh, so you basically are amplitude modulating both, both the I's and the Q's, and you can represent uh, four bits per point there. Now, the issue is that when you send these over the air, um, there will be interference. The, the components won't be perfect. There will be some noise introduced in the system. And so what you get is, uh, say, for, for bits or symbols that you send um, with that constellation diagram, you might receive something like that. And um, as long as there's 
enough separation between them, then you can uh, recover those symbols. And uh, you can add some error correction later once you get a, a bit stream to make it even more robust. All right, so in principle, all you need to do to transmit a digital signal is just have a, a in phase and quadrature phase signal being transmitted at a particular frequency for a certain amount of time, and then immediately jump to a different uh, set of amplitudes for your I and Q signals. And then you just keep hopping it around at the, the data rate that you want. Now, unfortunately, this takes an infinite amount of bandwidth. And as uh, I discussed earlier, um, uh, you, you, you want to use only a finite part of the RF spectrum uh, uh, for your own signal to, to share it with others. And so the reason why this takes infinite bandwidth um, goes back to a little bit of math where uh, square waves uh, are just a sum of uh, odd, odd harmonics of sort of the fundamental frequency. So if you have this square wave at some frequency, um, that is effectively the sum of the uh, a sine wave at that frequency plus a sine wave at three times that frequency, five times that frequency, and it just keeps going off to infinity. And so if you keep summing, summing them up together, you get closer and closer to a square wave. And so what you're effectively doing by transmitting um, different points is you're creating a square wave of amplitudes. And so this, this takes infinite bandwidth. And so the way that you deal with that, or one way that you can deal with that, is you just say, okay, I don't care. I'm just going to send, um, I'm going to use an infinite amount of bandwidth, and then I'm going to filter it out so that I only take up as much bandwidth as I'm allowed. Now, the problem with that is once you start filtering that, then the symbols that you're sending start to smear together because uh, you're destroying some information by filtering out those high frequency components. And this is known as intersymbol interference. Uh, but there is a cool trick that allows you to minimize intersymbol interference. Um, and typically, you use a, a raised uh, cosine filter uh, to minimize this intersymbol interference. And so here's what that is. So here's the impulse response of a raised cosine filter. Um, and so if you have a square wave and you send it through here, this is effectively a low pass filter. So it limits the amount of bandwidth that you're using. However, the interesting thing to note here is that um, uh, on these, these T boundaries, which are your, your bit, uh, your uh, symbol intervals, the, the, the amplitude of this impulse response at each of these T's except at zero is zero. And so effectively, what happens is if you send uh, the symbols out um, and put it through this filter, so say you, you transmit one and it generates sort of this signal here and then you transmit a two. Well, the interesting thing here is that at the, at the precise time that um, uh, that two is being transmitted, the contribution from all other symbols is zero right at this point. And this is how you can get uh, effectively zero inner symbol interference while still um, uh, taking up a limited amount of bandwidth. And so this is the magic that makes most digital modulation schemes work. There are some others, but uh, not going to get a, into that today. So one other twist here is that you might do this filtering completely on the sender side, and that would make sense. However, in the presence of noise and, and different uh, effects sending it over the air, it's actually more optimal to do half of the filtering on the transmitter side and half of the filtering on the receive side. And so if you have two filters and you multiply uh, their effect together, um, you uh, basically multiply their frequency response together. And so if you wanted to do half the filtering on the transmit side, half the filtering on the receive side, you basically do a, a square root of, of the filter that you want, or you take the, the square root of the, the, um, uh, the frequency 
attenuation that you want. So your raised cosine filter now becomes a root raised cosine filter. And so if you see this in GNU radio, this is exactly what it's doing. It's, it's, um, it's uh, applying that filter uh, to avoid inner symbol interference. So one other thing that you might have noticed back there is that to avoid this inner symbol interference, we have to precisely sample at this point. Um, if we sample here, then we effectively get the contribution of this symbol, of this symbol, of this symbol, and so it gets a bit noisy. And if, if it's too bad, then you can't actually recover the symbol that you wanted. And so um, to get no inner symbol interference, what you need to do is um, sample at, at precisely the right time. Now, that seems fine in theory, say, you know, the transmitter sending at uh, 9,600 bits per second, and the receiver is also sampling at 9,600 uh, bits per second. The problem is that um, these radios are made of real components, and real components won't have an exact frequency. Um, and also you need to, um, so there, there will be some drift between the transmitter and the receiver, and so you have to lock on to that. And you also have to lock on uh, to the phase. So even if you're in a situation where uh, your frequency is perfectly locked, you need to know um, sort of where you are in here. So you don't want to sample here, you don't want to sample here and here. You want to know that you sample right at, at the, uh, the peak of that symbol. And so this gives a rise to something known as uh, an eye diagram. So uh, this, uh, this is sort of a, a sample eye diagram from a, a patent I found. And so uh, this, this sort of visualizes what happens um, uh, when you sample early or sample late. So if you sample right on time, you'll notice that the recovered signal is pretty clearly defined at this point, this point, or this point. But if you're off a bit, then there's, there's less margin of, of error here. Um, and so uh, in the presence of noise, you could get confused to actually which point uh, you're actually trying to, to receive. And so uh, part, of, part of engineering these, these radio systems is to make this eye um, as it's known, as, as wide as possible so that you can tolerate the most um, frequency and phase errors and noise and things like that. So one way to, um, to synchronize to the sender is a, a simple approach, which is to just uh, correlate it with a known signal. Uh, and this is often called a preamble. And the, the, an easy way to do that is to uh, use our friend convolution again, put in the signal that you want to look for, um, do the exact same thing, and out pops um, a number that represents how similar the input signal is to the signal that you're looking for. And so this, this is a quick and dirty way to synchronize the phase, assuming that the frequency um, is, is close enough. And for some simple systems, uh, this is good enough. For example, uh, yesterday I was talking about uh, sniffing SCADA systems with a, a module that I wrote in GNU Radio. And um, this is actually good enough to synchronize onto the bit timing um, and decode all the bits, even though the frequency doesn't quite match up. It doesn't become a problem unless um, you get too far out of sync. And the packets are small there, so it works. Um, yeah, so as I said, you know, clocks will drift. If you want to deal with the clock drift issue, um, basically, you have to do something more advanced. So one way to do this is you measure or you compute some sort of function between the phase error um, of the received signal and, and what you want. Uh, this, this phase error will be noisy, so you put itself through some sort of low pass filter and use that in a feedback loop. Um, and so this is like called a phase lock loop, uh, which is used to recover uh, timing and phase. You can use a high order filter where you not only lock onto phase, but also lock onto the frequency. 
uh, and and this is starting to get into some uh, weird voodoo math magic um, that uh, I don't fully understand, and and I don't expect many other people to as well. There is a lot of uh, control theory and it, behind it for feedback loops and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but the takeaway point is that you can use these uh, to recover both phase and frequency information of the transmitter. Um, the one downside to this approach is that it takes time for these uh, these uh, PLLs to lock. And so um, if you're dealing with short packets that are sent in, in bursts, um, you usually will use a, a simple preamble. So the the final thing that you need to do is deal with carrier recovery. So um, if the frequency that your if your baseband frequency is not precisely matched with the transmitter, then what will actually happen to your IQ diagram is it will start to rotate. And so what you can do is you can measure this uh, as well and then create another uh, feedback loop to uh, correct for this and lock in on the transmitter's uh, carrier signal to sort of stabilize this so you can do uh, your, your symbol recovery um, and, and still stay sane. Um, and so what you can, you can do this independently of, um, of bit timing recovery as well. Um, you can do them in, in either order, but I believe usually for simplicity, um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, timing recovery is done first before carrier recovery and sort of the signal chain. So one other thing that I'll, I'll just briefly mention is that when you send a signal over the air, it won't necessarily have a flat frequency response, so that will distort uh, the incoming constellation that you see. Um, and there are, again, feedback algorithms to sort of estimate how uh, sending something over the air uh, distorts the signal. So um, briefly, one way that you could do that is you, um, you know what the sender is sending, you know what you received, you know if you modulated itself what that signal is supposed to look like. And so then you can look at the difference between the received signal and the signal that you thought you should receive and then uh, develop a, a filter to uh, undo that, um, that distortion um, that you get over the air. Um, now, this is, this is used for higher data rate stuff. Uh, in practice, if you're dealing with low data rate stuff like I have been, uh, you can just completely ignore it and assume that the, the air channel is, is um, completely uh, flat. Um, so I'll just leave that at that as one thing that you can add, and that gets very complicated very fast. All right, so after you've done timing and carrier recovery, it's really simple now. All you got to do is if you receive a little blip here is just find the closest constellation point and that's as easy as you know just drawing some some imaginary lines and and finding the uh the closest point and that that's basically all there is to simple recovery so once you've got that now you've got bits and bits are nice and familiar and we all love bits um after that there might still be some post-processing that you need to do so for example if you send packets, you need to know where exactly those packets start because you're, you're only receiving a bunch of bits. Uh, so you need to then synchronize on the frames that you receive over the air, and they themselves will often have uh, preambles, and the preambles uh, can be used for both timing recovery and frame synchronization, things like that. Uh, there's something called bit scrambling, and so this is used to sort of whiten the spectrum uh, and and have it uh, more more efficiently use the the RF spectrum and sort of flatten out uh, the frequency of the uh, of the transmitted uh, signal. Uh, and then this is this is not for security. This is just for making the the RF a bit nicer. And so if you want to reverse engineer a modem, uh, you'll look for like shift registers and and XORs and and things like that. That's used in the in the bit scrambling. Um, 
And so finally, there's a uh, error correction. So if you send stuff over the air, um, there will be noise. Some bits will get corrupted. Uh, you want to detect when those errors happen. So you can use something like a CRC. Uh, but the problem is then you can't recover from those errors. That might be fine. You might just want to retransmit it. If you want to get even fancier, there are error correction algorithms that will, by transmitting redundant information, uh, if you lose a bit of that information or a bit of, if a bit of that information is corrupted, uh, then you can actually um, recover what you originally intended to, uh, to send or receive. And so to, to sort of wrap this up, um, conceptually how, how this all works is you have your hardware here, you have your antenna, you have your hardware local oscillator here, it mixes it down to some intermediate frequency, you sample it with an analog to digital converter, uh, now you're in software, uh, in software, you have an, another local oscillator that more precisely locks onto the transmitter's carrier. You mix that, you uh, apply a, a low-pass filter or maybe some equalization. You do timing recovery, you do air, uh, carrier recovery, and then finally you get uh, your bit decision out of that. And then you can deal with, uh, deal with bits. Um, so if you want more information about any of the things I talked about right now, it's sort of a whirlwind tour of, of different things, uh, different topics. So there's Michael Osman's series of software-defined radio uh, videos. He made um, he uh, made the Hacker F, and as part of the Kickstarter campaign, uh, he is making a whole video series uh, taking you through all of the, um, all of the magic of, of DSP and, and SDR. Um, and they're, they're really interesting, uh, and I, I highly recommend them. There's also ziff.org's videos about signals. Uh, they go into some rants about like why you don't need, uh, 96 kilohertz audio at 24 bits for, you know, and, and listening use. And, and they have all these interesting things of like, uh, showing how bit dithering works and noise floors and, and all that crazy stuff and, and sampling theory and, uh, it's they're short, but they're great. And then finally, a lot of this uh, I got from the Scientist and Engineer's Guide to Digital Signal Processing uh, by uh, Stephen Smith. It's available online for free. All the PDFs are there. Uh, if you like it, you can buy a copy on Amazon. Um, but I find the PDFs or the, the websites just fine. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to thank you for uh, for listening, and uh, I apologize for the late start, but uh, hopefully this was informative for you all. Thank you.